Hi, dance friends, and welcome to the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. I'm Courtney Escoyne. And I'm Lydia Murray. We are editors at Dance Media, and in today's episode, we'll be talking about the Joy to the Polls campaign, which is an initiative that's bringing dance and music to people who are waiting in line to vote. Unpacking a Wall Street Journal columnist's critique of vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris's dancing, and then the backlash to that critique. Discussing a piece by New York Times chief dance critic Gia Corliss about how the pandemic is actually empowering dance artists to pursue positive change. And hearing a message from Kat Coliandro, the respected teacher and choreographer who is a leader of the Dance Safe, an organization that advocates for survivors of abuse. So lots to talk about, lots to hear about. First, though, um, just a reminder to rate and review and subscribe to this podcast on your listening platform of choice. And a thank you also to those of you who have already done that or wanted more of those things. And also be sure that you're signed up for our daily newsletter, which we promise won't be a heavy weight in your inbox. We know there's a lot of news coming at you right now, but it's just a, a quick digest rounding up the day's dance stories of note. And you can subscribe to that at thedanceedit.com. So now on to our weekly dance headline rundown, because even though the election feels all consuming right now, there was actually still a fair amount of non-election related dance news over the past week. Um, Courtney, you want to kick us off? Sure thing. So San Francisco Ballet announced that its 2021 season will now be entirely digital and include an online nutcracker this winter, a broadcast of A Midsummer Night's Dream, which got exactly one performance this spring before their theater was shut down due to the pandemic, and premieres from Miles Thatcher, Danielle Rowe, and Kathy Marston. Marston's, it's worth noting, will be a film version of her long-awaited Mrs. Robinson, which was meant to debut last April but was canceled due to the pandemic. Some bittersweet news. Uh, New York City Ballet will remain off stage until September of next year. Additionally, principals Ask LaCour, Gonzalo Garcia, and Maria Karaski will retire during the 2021 to 2022 season. However, joining the company as a soloist will be current Houston Ballet principal Chen Wai Chan, which we are so excited about. That was such a roller coaster. Such a, a roller release. coaster. <laughs> and also retweet the excitement, but also, oh my gosh, Maria Karaski retiring. What? End of an era. Yeah. So in further bittersweet news, uh, Kim Beers Bailey has been named Artistic Director of Philodenko, taking the helm from founder Joan Myers Brown, who, after 50 years, will step into the role of Artistic Advisor. After an eight-month hiatus due to the pandemic, the beloved and often memed hip-hop dance crew Jabberwockies will return to the stage in Las Vegas. The group will shift from the casino showroom to the large MGM Grand Arena with performances from Thursday through Monday starting November 6th. Uh, adding yet another wrinkle to the Alexandra Waterbury case, former New York City Ballet Principal Chase Finlay, currently the sole remaining defendant in her case, has filed a countersuit claiming that he has been the victim of abuse. I'm filing this one under. Thanks. I hate it. Ooh, deep breaths. Yikes. Um, and the Audrey Hepburn documentary is on the way. Um, my vintage loving heart is so full about that. Um, the film will feature dance-filled portraits of Hepburn choreographed by Wayne McGregor, interspersed with previously unseen archive footage of the star's travels and films. Hepburn in her youth will be danced by Royal Ballet Principal Francesca Hayward, and Alessandra Ferry will portray her later in life as a UNICEF ambassador. Insane casting. Yes, oh my gosh. Uh, Netflix dropped a new six-part docuseries last week, profiling six of the world's most influential dance artists, much to our surprise and delight. Uh, Move features Lil Buck and John Boogs, Ohad Naharan, Israel Galvin, Kimiko Versatil, and Akram Khan, and all episodes are now streaming. They really just jam-packed it with heavy hitters. I'm just, I love this. Also, Netflix never announces this, these things far in advance at all, and then we're all just like, wait, 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 there's another dance thing? Okay, cool. Yeah. Netflix just did not did not make nearly enough noise about this, so please spread the word. The Bavarian State Ballet is reportedly in quarantine after at least six dancers tested positive for COVID-19. Woof. Uh, the Joyce Theater has been streaming a revival of Melissa Finlay's 1988 solo State of Darkness. Uh, this week, seven star dancers have been and are continuing to tackle the 35-minute solo set to Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. Uh, Lloyd Knight, Cassandra Trinnery, and Sarah Mearns are on tap for this weekend. More dream casting. 
Three incredibly influential dance industry figures have recently passed away. The dancer, actress, and choreographer Marge Champion, whose career took her from Hollywood to Broadway and beyond. Susan Hendel, the former New York City ballet dancer and ballet master, and the Tony-winning theater designer Ming Cho Lee. And a new AI experiment from Adobe can, theoretically, make you look like a better dancer, at least on camera. The tech tracks the timing of dance moves and the beats of the music in order to synchronize the two, theoretically making your dancing look on beat even if you weren't. Good news for TikTok? I I find this news equal parts fascinating and horrifying. There's something deeply unsettling about it. (laughs) I'm probably overreacting. Everything is horrifying right now. That's a... 2020 mood anyway that is, that is such a 2020 mood so <laughs> in our first segment we're going to talk about the upcoming election because of course we are how could we not it is perhaps the defining event of our lifetimes and it's less than a week away oh lord help us specifically we want to talk about an effort called joy to the polls which was created by the nonpartisan coalition election defenders and the idea behind the initiative is to lift the spirits of people waiting in ridiculous voting lines by bringing them dance and music performances by local artists it's you know it's a campaign designed to get people motivated to vote and to help them feel safe while doing so but it's also calling attention to the rampant voter suppression that is the reason many people have to wait in these ridiculous lines. And that suppression is disproportionately affecting black and brown people. So as Margaret just said, Joy to the Polls is part of Election Defenders. Um, it's led by Nalini Stamp, who's the director of strategy for the Working Families Party and uh, the campaign director for Election Defenders. The effort launched this past Saturday in Pennsylvania as part of the first ever Vote Early Day. And Joy to the Polls is actually a two-part initiative. One facet is the moving concert highlighting local talent, and the second component is weekly training in de-escalation tactics in the event of voter intimidation at the polls. Election Defenders also hands out water, personal protective equipment, and hand warmers to those online if they need them, and the artists are given a stipend, which of course especially matters in these difficult times. On first viewing, the videos that went viral last weekend may have appeared to only show people who were making the best of a less an ideal situation in the moment, uh, waiting to vote. Um, Not everyone necessarily knew that this was part of this larger movement, and some people may not have immediately considered the deeper implications of a predominantly black and brown group standing in a relatively long line waiting to vote. And of course, voter suppression and intimidation have long histories in this country. The election protection hotline run by Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law has reportedly received over 100,000 calls since July 1st, and certain campaign messages could lead bad actors to feel emboldened. So this initiative is very much uh, needed right now. Well, and something I will say about this that I really appreciate, like one, paying artists Like, heck yeah, that's amazing. Clap, Mm -hmm. clap. Two, you know, I think there's very much a sense in Western culture, particularly Western capitalist cultures, that dance is a thing that only belongs uh, on stages, something that, you know, is this like fine art that's like put on a proscenium, that's where it exists, that's where it lives. It's like a very specific part of the population can dance, a very specific part of the population has access to dance. But if you look beyond like Western cultures, dance in a lot of societies historically has had like a much deeper place in community and in daily life. It's meant more than just quote unquote entertainment or just high art. It's part of how you live your life. And I think that this is a way of bringing dance into something that's actually very key to our democracy is voting. And so even though the reason that this has to exist is terrible. The fact that dance is a thing that's being used to try to impact positive change in just everyone's lives is actually rather extraordinary. Right. It's helping to fill several needs while tapping into the power of joy as a tool of resistance. And that actually segues really nicely into our next segment, um, talking about who's allowed to dance, where dance is supposed to happen, and how people react to expressions of joy, especially through dance, especially by people of color. So last week, Wall Street Journal columnist Peggy Noonan published an opinion piece about the final presidential debate, at least in theory, that's what it was about. It somehow ended up devoting significant real estate to criticism of Kamala Harris's dancing. And if you've been anywhere near social media recently, you've probably seen the clip that Noonan was referring to of Harris dancing and laughing in the pouring rain at a campaign rally, because it basically became an instant meme. It was just so joyful and happy. 
Noonan, though, her take on it was that Harris came across as insubstantial and frivolous, which, of course, seemed particularly egregious because in the same piece, she praised the liveliness of Trump's rallies. And Trump has become notorious for his own campaign trail dancing, one of the sources of that liveliness. The backlash to Noonan's column was swift. And you know what? I'm just going to say it. It was pretty fantastic. Mm, Yeah. So going to save you the trouble of looking up Noonan's column because I don't think we should devote more clicks to it, to be perfectly frank. But just a relevant passage here for you. She's dancing with drumlines and beginning rallies with, what's up, Florida? She's throwing her head back and laughing a loud laugh, especially when nobody said anything funny. She's a younger candidate going for the younger vote, and she's going for a happy warrior vibe, but she's coming across as insubstantial, frivolous. So there's just so many things to unpack there. Um, And there have been many great columns written talking about what is problematic about this piece and what is problematic about this take. And basically what it comes down to is good old fashioned sexism and racism. It's that same double standard for women that says um, if you push for your point and make serious points, well, you're too serious, you're not relatable enough. And if you do something joyful or make a joke, then, oh, well, she doesn't take this seriously. And then that is even more protracted for women of color. And the fact that here in the year 2020, someone can actually seriously look at Kamala Harris having this moment of genuine joy and dancing to express herself and just being a human being and look at that and say, well, this disqualifies you for public office. You're not taking this seriously, especially, again, in the year 2020, when you look at who we currently have as president. It's absurd, and I don't entirely understand how anyone could sit down and write that. Agreed. Um, And part of this is she kind of appears to police Harris's behavior from the perspective of maintaining respectability for women, uh, because, you know, women struggle more than men and, you know, so forth, completely failing to acknowledge that the challenges Harris faces as a black woman are different from those that she faces as a white woman. And at one point, she said, the world which doubts our strength, our character and our class is watching. If you can't imitate gravity, could you at least try for seriousness, which Policing other women's behavior in an effort to um, ensure the respectability of the group is problematic in itself. Here is another question: Why? Why does dancing make you unserious? Inherently unserious. Why is this was the like that Good Morning America story I wrote last summer? Like so much of the basis of that was why is this something to be made fun of? And it carries through in so many different aspects of life. And like the way that Western culture, any type of creative expression, particularly dance, but all creative expression, unless it's something that you are one of a very niche handful of people who does it and makes absurd amounts of money doing it and has absurd amounts of clout, you're treated as frivolous. The work you do is treated as frivolous. It's not treated as work. It's just treated as you know, oh, that odd little hobby you have, or oh, this is something to be made fun of. It just, it really comes down to why why does dancing make someone less serious? Right. Yeah, nobody should be criticized for the act of dancing. Like, I never want to see those videos of Trump dancing again, but he shouldn't be criticized for dancing either. Dancing doesn't make you a silly person who can't be taken seriously. It just makes you a person, period. People dance. Like, this is part of our humanity. There shouldn't be anything wrong with dancing that's not inherently unprofessional. Neither is laughing or expressing joy uh, in any of the ways that Senator Harris did. And those things are also racially coded in this context. Yeah. Let women be women. Let people be people. Come on. So in our next segment, we're going to talk about a story that actually hit on a lot of the themes that have recurred on the podcast recently. Um, A few days ago, Gia Corliss, who's the chief dance critic at the New York Times, published an essay called Could Dance Be a Weapon All Over Again? And the title refers to a 1932 performance called The Dance is a Weapon by the New Dance Group, which was part of the era's radical dance movement pushing back against authoritarianism. And Corliss sees echoes of that movement in dance today um, in the sense that the pandemic and politics and racial injustice are ripping apart the world as we knew it. But dance artists are responding by beginning to totally reimagine dance culture. And in doing so, they're addressing problems that have long plagued dance's systems and organizations. So as we've said several times on the podcast, 
this moment of crisis isn't just a tragedy, it's also an opportunity for the dance world. We, When we were talking about discussing this on the podcast, I think something we all expressed was, oh, this is kind of everything we've been talking about on this podcast since March, just condensed into an essay. With a nice little bow on it, yeah. I mean, I was intrigued by one of the points that she made, which is that while this movement, we are, we are seeing it forge dancer activists, we haven't yet really seen how that activism will affect the dances themselves, mm. the works themselves. And if you're going to compare this moment to the 30s, I mean, the dances of that era were some of the dance artists' most powerful actions, like Graham steps in the street as a response to fascism. That was an iconic, and, and it still resonates, that response. And that kind of message is really hard to convey digitally. You sort of need the immediacy of an in-person audience for it to have its intended effect. Which is interesting in that we are in this moment where gathering as an audience in the way that we're used to doing is obviously not feasible. And it does also raise a question for me. I don't think it's necessarily completely true that there can't be a digital version of like what those pieces were to the 1930s, like the 2020 version. Why can't it exist online? And I think the question then kind of becomes because of the democratization of access that the internet suggests how do you cut through the noise? Are we going to immediately recognize the thing that is maybe epoch defining when there is just so much content? Right. I think now some of that response to the current moment is kind of built into, um, maybe not built into the medium, but we are in the midst of this racial reckoning and we're able to have more diversity in the artwork that we create digitally across geographic boundaries. Just the use of digital technology in itself as a response to the pandemic, I think, becomes part of the art in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't mean to misrepresent her words. I don't think she was saying in the piece that we can't do this digitally. I think it was just the sense of like, we have yet to sort of hit on the right formula, maybe, mm -hmm. right. in that digital space. Please read the piece. It's very dense, but it does kind of sum up a lot of things that a lot of us have been thinking and talking about recently. And I think the ultimate takeaway was hope, like mm -hmm. hope that this emergency will lead to a better dance world, will lead to more resonant art, will lead to more and different voices being heard. We all need some hope right now. So <laughs> go check it out. So now we have the next installment in our Voice Memo series. And this week, we're hearing from Kat Cogliandro, who is a widely respected dancer and choreographer and teacher. If you're involved in the dance convention scene, you definitely know her. Um, she's also an activist working to make the dance world a safer and a more inclusive place for everybody, but especially for young students. She's one of the leaders of the Dance Safe, which offers a way for survivors of abuse to safely and anonymously report their experiences, and then helps them find the support and the resources, legal resources, therapeutic resources, ed educational resources that they need. So here she is to talk about all of that work. Hello, my name is Kat Caliandro. I use they, she pronouns. I am a dancer, a teacher, a choreographer, and I'm also vice president of an organization called The Dance Safe. Um, wow, quarantine. We've all been in it. We've all had our different experiences. And um, I just wanted to get on here and share some, you know, just some words of love today. Through this stillness, I have been forced to see my own things. Um, I've always spoken up about the way that I feel, and I've always tried to listen to the way that I feel, but I guess I never realized how busy I kept myself in order to, like, I don't know, live up to some expectation that wasn't mine. It was whether it be like my family or society or the industry, just like constantly working as if like I'm not enough unless I prove to you that I am. But in quarantine, you know, being asked to be still, I can't teach at Broadway Dance Center. I couldn't go on tour to choreograph at my studios and you know, celebrity tour has been different and the heat tour next year is going to be different. Everything's a little bit different, right? A lot of it different. It's really asked me to sit and to open my eyes and to see and not to be able to unsee, um, which has been hard. I've been struggling a lot with my depression. Um, I've been struggling with asking myself who I am and who I want to be. And 
I think sometimes through the most difficult moments are the ones that we shed the most skin and are able to grow an inch more, an inch more, an inch more. And, you know, in this life, I'm realizing that growth is, is everything. Being able to wake up and take a breath and just be like, you know what? Today I'm going to learn. Today I'm going to learn. Whatever life throws at me today, I'm going to learn. And that has really been um, a huge mission for me, a huge goal, I guess, uh, over this quarantine. I hope that if you're listening to this, that you know that you're important. And if you don't know, I hope I can remind you today that you are so important. It's okay to say no. It's okay to set boundaries. It's okay to have values. It's okay to have opinions. I hope that whatever opinions, values, boundaries, moments, things you set in your life are are done via education and curiosity and reading and exploring and wonder. I hope that you know that your worth isn't dependent on how many people tell you that you're worthy or how many people like your Instagram post today or how many people viewed your TikTok. I hope that you know that your worth is an internal shining light and it is such a wonderful one to turn on. And once you access that, I hope that you know that you're allowed to stand up for yourself. Even if people call you difficult, I want to remind you that that's not your problem. That's their problem. And together we can be difficult by holding each other accountable. You know, at the Dance Safe, we talk a lot about holding our industry accountable. And I really believe that accountability begins with healing. And healing begins with this acknowledgement that I am broken and you are too. And together we can fill our cracks with different colors and become these better human beings. More kindness, more respect, more knowledge, more understanding, more I see you, I honor you, I hear you. And at the Dance Safe, you know, we really want to connect people to those pathways to begin their healing journeys however they need. And, you know, in parallel to hold our our community and our industry accountable for creating safer dance spaces so that people have the availability to be themselves and to feel good about who they are. Um, we really want to normalize having these difficult conversations. Um, you know, cuties came out of, um, I don't know, I've lost the sense of time, but it came out recently, I, I, I suppose. And it really caused this uproar of how is this happening? How is this okay? And what I think it did was it was like, Well, actually, this is really happening all of the time in our dance studios and our dance competitions. And if you're feeling this outraged about a movie, let's take that outrage and let's put it into our community and speak up for our community. So if you're listening to this today, I hope you know the power of your voice. I hope you know how important your voice is. And through this educated voice, through studying through understanding, through learning, through the experiences of others, we as a community can set the standard for the dance spaces that we want to be dancing in, right? So I'm sending you all love near and far. I'm always here for you. If you have questions, concerns, you can always email me at thedancesafe at gmail.com. And I hope you know that you are loved, that you are not alone. And if you ever need help, it's okay to reach out your hand and ask. Sending love. Keep on dancing, y'all. We're going to get through this together. Let's do it. Thank you so much for that, Kat. Please be sure to follow Kat on Instagram at Kat underscore Cogliandro. That's C-O-G-L-I-A-N-D-R-O. She's an inspiring follow. She's also just a delightful follow. Um, As Kat mentioned, you can email her directly at thedancesafe at gmail.com. And you can also learn more about The Dance Safe via Instagram. They're at thedancesafe. And their form that survivors can use to report abuse is linked directly in their bio, and we'll include it in our episode description as well. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We will be back next week for more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world. Keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Go vote, and mind how you go, friends. Yes, please go vote. Bye, everyone. The 
The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, Lydia Murray, and Cadence Neenan. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those football sounds. Find out more about the Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.